Tropical diseases, encompass all infectious diseases such as malaria, lymphatic filariasis, African trypanosomiasis, leishmaniosis, onchocerciasis, dengue, and chikungunya occur solely in the tropics and thrive in hot, humid conditions. Approximately 1 billion people from tropical and subtropical areas covering developing and least developed countries of Latin America, Caribbean, Africa, South Asia and Southeast Asia are affected by these diseases. Due to global warming and increase in the temperature, many infectious diseases have resurfaced with vengeance making it difficult for health authority across the world. Crumbling health infrastructure reduced investment in public health and a new variant of drug-resistance infectious disease have wreaked havoc in the developing countries. People wear clothes according to the climatic conditions. This helps them to sustain the climatic conditions. During summer, people sweat a lot. So, they like to wear light cotton clothes. But clothes are not readily available. There is a process in making clothes. Cotton grows on plants. It is found inside the fruit of the cotton plant called bowls. Farmers pick the cotton out from these bowls. The picked cotton looks like a bundle of some fluffy material but actually, it has thin fibers in it. These fibers are twisted together to make long threads. This process is called spinning. These threads are then woven into fabrics by weavers. The weaving machine is called a loom. The fabric is then dyed in unusual colors. Beautiful designs can be printed on it to make it look prettier. Dyeing and printing of fabric are done in a factory by dyers and printers. This fabric is then sent to the market and is used to make a variety of clothes. These clothes are then turned into beautiful outfits. We get other clothes and materials from plants. Jute is also obtained from a plant and is used to make gunny bags, ropes, carpets, etc. Linen fiber is obtained from the flax plant, it is mainly used to make bed sheets, curtains and towels. Coir is obtained from the outer covering of a coconut. Coir is used to make foot mats, ropes, mattresses, etc. You will find jute is used to make many other useful products.
observe a car, a house or even a kite. You will notice that all these objects have a structure or a frame. A frame gives shape and strength to the object. In the same way, our skeletal system is a frame that gives shape to and supports our body. The functions of the skeletal system are, to give shape and support, to protect the inner organs, such as brain, heart, lungs etc. to help in movement. The skeletal system or skeleton is made up of bones. An adult has 206 bones. The human skeleton consists of the skull, the backbone, the ribcage and two pairs of limbs, which are attached to two pairs of girdles. Along with muscles, the skeletal system helps our body to move. Together, they are called the muscular skeletal system. Bones in different parts of the body differ in number, size, and shape. Some bones are long, like those of the arm and leg, some are short like those in the wrist and the ankle. Some are flat, like those in the skull, and the bone of our ear has an irregular shape. Bones are connected by flexible tissues called ligaments. The long bones are filled with a soft fatty material called bone marrow. The skull is made of two sets of bones bones that make up the forehead and the back of your head. There are eight flat bones that are interlocked. Bones that make your face. The face is made up of 14 bones that protect the eyes, nose, and tongue. The jawbone is the largest and strongest bone on our face. The lower jaw can be moved, but not the upper jaw. The movable lower jaw helps you to speak and eat food. The hard and bony skull protects the delicate brain from injury. Good facilities in school have a profound impact on the outcomes of students' learning and teacher retention. Good facilities help in students' behavior, engagement, learning, and growth. According to the research three-fourths of the schools are with inadequate building features and 58% of the schools have an unsatisfactory environment. Most of the schools lack 21st century facilities. It is one of the important predictors of student development and teacher retention. Though the cost of improving facility is high, the result will give us overwhelming results. Five aspects of the school facility that needs to be improved are acoustics, air quality, lighting, temperature, and space. Acoustics is the first one. According to research schools with lesser noise level have garnered better results compared to schools with higher acoustic levels. Less noise also reduces students' and teachers' distractions. The second important quality is good air quality. Many schools suffer with sick building syndrome which results in absenteeism and performance of the students. Students with asthma are affected because of the inferior quality of the airflow. Poorly ventilated places naturally attract bacteria, viruses, and allergens that contribute to childhood diseases. Every school should have good lighting. Good lighting also plays an advent role in student development. This not only boosts the morale of the students and teacher, it also helps in reducing the off-task behavior. Adequate temperature is also an important part of good school quality. Inadequate temperature is very difficult to work in a school environment. The ideal temperature between 68 Fahrenheit and 74 Fahrenheit. 
Last and one the important qualities are spacious classrooms. Crowded classrooms are always linked to increased levels of aggression. The key to form and strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, new neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling facial expressions and gestures, and adults return the serve responding in a very directed and meaningful way. It starts very early in life when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object the adult says its name. This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults children then learn how to deceitful writing and eventually to write themselves. Each stage builds on what came before, ensuring the children have adult caregivers who consistently engaged in serving return interaction beginning in infancy builds the foundation in the brain for all the learning behavior and health that follow. The coffee industry in Vietnam now provides a livelihood for millions of people, mostly around small farms like this just a few acres. Across the country farmers like Hoban produces a staggering million and a half tons of coffee, it's a key export for the country and on number one source of coffee in Britain, coffee is one of the most valuable traded goods on earth. Globally the industry's worth more than 40 billion pounds, it's the single most important tropical commodity traded worldwide accounting for nearly half of total exports of tropical products. The crucial year is 1986, that's when Vietnamese Communist Party had a major meeting and they realized the economy was in a terrible state and they decide to relax the rules and among other things start growing and exporting coffee on a massive scale. The state plan collective farms were swept away, 
powerful millions small hoardings emerged in their place and in the 1990s the coffee production grew a staggering 30% per year. A wind turbine is a device that will convert wind into mechanical movement which we can use the power water pump or electricity generator now the power of the turbine creates, is obviously dependent on the wind speed is also obviously dependent on the number of sails the area of the sails and the angle that the sails makes to the wind so if you can imagine if the turbine blades flatten to the wind, the wind is just gonna bend it and if there is a slight angle when the wind hits it. It's gonna turn the blade making use that for powering things, you can have one by making some very very simple windmills and it's sort of things you can make from bits and pieces lying around the house news that drive very small generators to power electronic devices. Until the advent of new medications people diagnosed with schizophrenia occupied one half of the hospital beds in the United States, one out of every 10,000 people come down with schizophrenia and 750,000 are treated every year, several million people in the United States currently have had this disorder at one time or another in their lifetime, although we think of schizophrenia, as a mental disorder, for lifetime risk of this illness is the same. As for diabetes which courses is, unless the one hears a lot more about, and for which a lot more research and treatment development, the PK onset in somewhat different for men and women men usually began to have difficulties, in their late teens or early twenties, as women tend to begin to have this illness, in their middle twenties or even into their thirties.
Dr. Grivois How important is vitamin D with regards to health? Very importantly, vitamin D which, by the way, is not really a vitamin, it's a hormone, a steroid-like hormone, is responsible for upregulating the last count I got over 200 genes in the body that, at regulate normal body metabolism, in fact now we found vitamin D receptors is in almost every organ system in every cell, so for optimum health we have to have sufficient quantities of vitamin D. So now how common is vitamin D deficiency? Vitamin D deficiency is now considered to be pandemic, worldwide not just in certain countries but in almost all countries it is interesting that even in those tropical countries where you would think there's plenty of sunlight, that most people are so clothing themselves that they are limiting how much sun they actually do get in so even in some countries like they, Saudi Arabia and the East, at least half of the population still are vitamin D deficient. The brain is basically built from the bottom up, first, the brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills and then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills, biologically the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience it's expecting the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry it's built into our biology, the interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in the reciprocal relationship, relationship that children have when they will be adults in their lives, by that we mean, what we refer to as the serve and return nature of children's interaction when they are adult development and the impact of experience on development, not a one-way street, it's a back and forth interaction the brain is a highly integrated organ which has multiple sections that specialize in different processes, so we have parts of the brain that are involved more in cognitive function and the other parts they are involved in the processing of emotions and parts involved in seeing and hearing, so if a child is emotionally can well put together and socially competent that will affect, more positive and productive learning and if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be his or her learning is gonna be impaired by that kind of emotional interference.
Today a hundred and fifty thousand farmers in India have committed suicide in areas where seed has been destroyed where they have to buy the seed from Monsanto, and buy it every year at a very very high cost and that high cost seed is getting them into debt and that debt is pushing them to suicide. What we have done is create community seed banks places where we collect and save seeds rescue them from disappearance, multiply them and then distribute them according to farmers needs, and about 40 community seed banks have been created across the length and breadth of India, places where these have been created farmers are not in the stress, because the biggest cost today is seeds and chemicals. These seed banks have now been a new place where you can respond to the new crisis of globalization on the one hand and climate change on the other. Globalization has lead to farmer suicides we are able to take these seeds to the suicide zones, and, distribute the seeds so that farmers can break out of that dependency, grow food crops, get out of debt. We have been able to create community seed banks to deal with climate change with the extreme flooding, the new droughts the cyclones, the hurricanes, that lead to salinization and today for us the world can seed has become the place from where, we are responding to the worst tragedies and the worst crisis of our times. Thermodynamics Alright let's start, thermodynamics is the science of the flow of heat, thermal is heat and dynamic is the motion, thermodynamics was developed, largely beginning in the 1800s, at the time of the industrial revolution, the taming of the fuel, the beginning of generating power by burning fossil fuel, so anyway thermodynamics states from the same period as, getting fossil fuels out of the ground, it's universal. Turns out everything around us moves energy around one way or the other through biological systems like burning calories, burning ATP, creating heat, your warm-blooded animals, you need energy to move your arms around, move around, in the chemical systems obviously carbs, ketos and etc, and even in the astrophysics when we talk about stars, black holes and etc you're moving energy around. You're moving heat around and you're changing matter through thermodynamic, and the concepts of thermodynamics have even been applied to economics, these things are in the eye of big companies like Enron, you know completely out of equilibrium, the fine equilibrium economics or non-equilibrium economics.
Your body is composed of trillions of cells lots of different types of cells that make up different organs and other parts of your body. Your body is also 10 times the number of bacteria calls it home but don't be afraid, these bacterias do more good than harm to you. And besides just think if you want to strike up a conversation with your tenant you and your bacteria do have a few things in common. Also, share some common characteristics that make them living things all organisms are composed of cells, the basic fundamental unit of life they contain DNA as a heritable genetic material and they can reproduce. They transcribe DNA into RNA and transform RNA into protein and ribosomes. They can also regulate transport across the cell membrane and require chemical energy for some similar processes. The number one biggest difference between the bacteria in your body and the cells making up your body are these tiny cellular components called or organelle. You've actually learned a lot about organelles in other lessons without knowing it. Organelles are simply memory-bound compartments within a cell such as the nucleus, mitochondria, chloroplasts, Golgi and endoplasmic reticulum, you are eukaryote your cells are eukaryotic, eukaryotic cells contain membrane bound organelles including a nucleus eukaryote can be single celled or multi celled such as you, me, plants, fungi and insects. I have been writing non-fiction for years, actually, and, but secretly wanting to be a novelist. When I first started writing at the age of 30, it was with the intention of writing fiction, but I took a little detour for 10 or 12 years and wrote non-fiction which I have absolutely no regret about it at all. I think it was exactly the right thing for me to do. But there was that dream tucked away inside of me to do this. Now remember reading something that Eudora Welty wrote, who is, you know, the great novelist from Mississippi who had a big influence on me actually. She said, no art ever came out of not risking your neck. And I think she's absolutely right about that. It felt that way to me at the time, it actually feels that way to me every time I sit down to write something. Finally, in the early 90s, I took my deep breath, and started writing fiction. It felt risky to me at the time to do that. And one of the very first things I wrote was, what I thought was going to be the first chapter of a novel, called The Secret Life of Bees. I wrote it in 1992, and it is actually essentially the first chapter of the novel as it is now.
Let's take a look at this video of these little kids they were offered the option of having one marshmallow immediately or two marshmallows 15 minutes later and you've got some very cute videotape of this experiment. So let's take a look. What we found is a very simple and direct way of measuring a competence that seems to make an important life difference. A researcher tells these preschoolers that she's going to leave the room if they wait for her to come back without eating the marshmallows they'll get two marshmallows or they can ring the bell and she'll come back right away but then they only get one marshmallow. I want ring though. You won't ring the bell. Okay, looking at children over time. Dr. Michelle has found that being able to wait longer at four has some pretty powerful implications and what are those powerful implications is that that later in life. They're more disciplined and have more self-control is that pretty much it? Well, they are more likely to achieve their life goals. They have better relationships. They did better on their sit is crazy all because they waited 15 minutes for don't wash me, and I think it is crazy. I probably would have eaten all three but yeah me too. But um you know actually yes. The ability to be able to pursue your goals in this case it was stabbed two marshmallows versus one and not going automatic and just grabbed the marshmallow is a very important skill, but I think a main point in mind in the making is that these skills can be taught if you re 14 or 40 or 4 it's not ever too late and any child can learn them any adult can teach them and it's never too late. This is a bomb calorimeter this is the actual piece of equipment that research reviews to calculate the energy content of either biodiesel or maybe even the potato chips that you had for lunch today. When they calculate the amount of energy they're going to calculate it in heat units which would either be joules or calories. I want you to look inside the bomb calorimeter inside here you can see that there's a silver bucket. Water goes all in here and this is actually the bomb is the smaller silver cylinder what you do is put your fuel sample in there then. These two electrodes are connected to the bomb these provide the spark that will ignite your sample when your sample burns or combust that gives off energy so how is the energy collected or how did how does a scientist figure out how much energy is being given off. Well it's a closed system there's a lid here that goes on top of this calorimeter and what's in here in the lid is a stir the stir is going to stir the water that's in this big pool here so that the heat given off from the sample is going to warm the water in the uniform way this is the temperature probe this goes down in the water off so and measures the change in temperature because as the sample is burned it will give off heat and the temperature of the water will increase so the lid goes on the sample is prepared the last thing that you need to make make a combustion reaction happen is oxygen and at some point during the process some oxygen is added by a tank that's connected to the calorimeter here so we are going to burn a sample of the biodiesel that you've prepared and get some feedback on the energy content of it you'll be able to use this to compare it to petroleum based fuels like octane.
galaxies in a cluster roughly 300 million light years from Earth could contain as much as 100 times more dark matter than visible matter, according to an Australian study. The research, published today, used powerful computer simulations to study galaxies that have fallen into the coma cluster, one of the largest structures in the universe in which thousands of galaxies are bound together by gravity. It found the galaxies could have fallen into the cluster as early as 7 billion years ago, which, if our current theories of galaxies' evolution are correct, suggests they must have lots of dark matter protecting the visible matter from being ripped apart by the cluster. Dark matter cannot be seen directly but the mysterious substance is thought to make up about 84% of the matter in the universe. International Center for Radio Astronomy Research PhD student Cameron Yosin who led the study, says the paper demonstrates for the first time that some galaxies that have fallen into the cluster could plausibly have as much as 100 times more dark matter than visible matter. Yozin, who is based at the University of Western Australia, says the galaxies he studied in the Coma cluster are about the same size as our own Milky Way but contain only 1% of the stars. He says the galaxies appear to have stopped making new stars when they first fell into the cluster between 7 and 10 billion years ago and have been dead ever since, leading astrophysicists to label them failed galaxies. A language dies when the last person who speaks it dies. But you know, sometimes people say it dies when the second last person who speaks it dies, because the last person has nobody to talk to. Well, of course, languages have come and gone throughout history as communities have come and gone. But what's happening now is something really quite extraordinary. Well, there are about 6,000 languages in the world at the moment, more or less. Nobody knows the exact number. Of these, about half of them are so seriously in danger, are likely to die out in the course of present century. Now the present century is a hundred years, half is three thousand languages. So, that means one language is dying out somewhere in the world average every two weeks. There are all kinds of reasons why languages die, one is physical reason when people are affected by famine, disease and earthquake. Another is genocide, when some countries deliberately stamp out a small language. The main reason is globalization. That is, some huge languages in the world, like English, Arabic, Spanish, and French, and these are like stream rollers crushing the smaller languages they find in their path. A great deal can be done to preserve endangered language. The first thing is that the people themselves must want the language to be preserved. That's very important. The second thing is that the powers that be must want the language to be preserved. They must be respect for the minority languages in their care. The third thing has to be there, of course, is cash. It costs quite a lot of money to preserve an endangered language. Think about it, you have to train the teachers, you have to write books for the children. And all sorts of things. It doesn't cost a extraordinary amount money but it does cost a bit. So without money, endangered languages don't have a positive future.
I marveled at how often powerful feel powerless but in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there's no decline in involvement in organizations which seek to share wealth and opportunities, protect one another's rights and work towards the common good. According to the United Nations, civil society groups have grown 40-fold since the turn of last century. Internationally, the nonprofit sector is worth $1 trillion, and there are 700,000 such organizations in Australia alone. The UN recognizes 37,000 specifically civil society organizations across the globe, and gave 3,500 accreditation to the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a profound growth in NGOs, the third sector, as some call it. As Robert Putnam discovered in the field of local government in Italy, the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic associations. Under appropriate conditions, sound receptors. You've got sound receptors in your ear and they are beautiful. We're not going to talk about them at any length, but there's little flappy, these little spiky things going along in your ear and they can translate vibrational energy coming from your ear, hurting your eardrum, being translated into a vibration into the fluid in your ear into a physical motion of these little receptors there into an electrical motion into an electrical signal that goes into your ear. So, all of that, all of that's pretty impressive stuff. We're not going to talk about the details of it, but I invite some of you who want to learn more about this, particularly MIT students, I think find receptors really quite remarkable kinds of devices, 